Hi, this is James Davenport, Associate Dean of Social Sciences for Rose State College, and I am with Ray Carter. Ray is the director of OCPA's Center for Independent Journalism. He has two decades of experience in journalism and communications, and previously served as a capital reporter for the Journal Record, media director for the Oklahoma House of Representatives, and chief editorial writer at The Oklahoman. As a reporter for the Journal Record, Carter received 12 Car Carl Rogan Awards in four years, including awards for investigative reporting, general news reporting, feature writing, spot news reporting, business reporting, and sports reporting. So, Ray, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Um, what we wanted to discuss today is some of the challenges that families face in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, we really do have kind of a wide selection of options uh, of parents to choose among schools. Uh, the state even a few years ago passed, uh, I guess what's referred to as open transfer, where you're supposed to be able to easily transfer from one public school to another uh, if your family feels like the one that you're in isn't, isn't sufficient for some reason. Uh, uh, and as far as private schools or homeschooling, the state doesn't have a huge regulatory burden on those. But we know there are still challenges uh, that families face in trying to take advantage of these op op uh, options. And uh, apparently one of the big ones revolves around that issue of open transfer. And so uh, I'd like you maybe we'll, we'll start with there and, and talk about that some uh, and see how that might bleed over into some of these other areas. Sure. Well, the, like you say, the open transfer a few years ago, they, they it's actually been on the books since the 90s, but it was very, very restrictive. A few years ago, they they amended the law and made it a lot more a lot more accessible for families because previously one of the big hangups was if you wanted to transfer to another public school district, the district where you were in had to say, OK, we'll let you go. And uh, it, it won't surprise you. A lot of them. I said, oh no, no, you need to you really need to stay here and, and the money associated with you. And so, that that's kind of the key, right? Is that schools do receive a, a at least a portion of their funding based on population level, student levels, yes. uh and, and that can be a daily count uh or whatnot. But uh in that situation where the school recognized that if the student leaves, this portion of funding leaves with them. That surely reduces the incentive for them to give give the okay to leave, right? It, it did, yeah. It, it's the the state portion of the per pupil funding. It's it gets a little complicated, but eventually the 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 money follows the kid. Uh, mm -hmm. It's usually a, a couple years after they leave before it actually kicks in. But if you have a declining school population, sooner or later you're going to fill it financially, and and so that that was a and a problem with open transfer. And if, like I say, a few years ago they changed the law. And one thing they did is they made it, uh, I think it's almost year round now where you can apply to do it. And then the school you're leaving no longer has to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. the, the main limit now is the school you want to go to has to accept you and say that we've got room for you. Okay. Um, it, it has it has benefited a lot of people. And it's actually shown that there is a lot more of an appetite for uh, school choice and other options than I think people were wanting to admit before. Uh, I'll try to find my notes, but I, I was looking up in 2020 before the reforms, there were only 391 requests filed statewide. In 2020, it got to a little over 1,200. But then the in 2022 is when the, the reforms kicked in, and that number jumped up to nearly 11,000 uh, wow. applications for open transfer. So there's a huge, obviously a huge desire for it, a huge increase with that. And that's, that's students moving really just from one public school to another public school, yes. right? In in that yes. in that situation, uh, and so uh, and I'm I don't know. I suspect uh, some of the ways that certain schools or school districts handled the COVID situation mm -hmm. may have driven some of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the debates over you know content that's uh, being presented either in classrooms or materials in libraries and whatnot mm -hmm. may have uh, you know helped bump that number up as well as parents are starting to look for and pay attention to, I guess you would say, more of these kinds of issues. Yeah, I, I think I think those issues play down. I mean, it's, it varies from family to family and kid to kid. Sure. There's a lot of reasons. And, and obviously the COVID response and, and some of the issues you just mentioned have, 
have heightened parental awareness and, and sometimes desire to like, eh, I don't, I don't like what's going on in this school. Maybe we can mm -hmm. go to one down the road. And so we've seen obviously a lot more people have applied and, and, and a good number of those, I think uh, roughly 80% of those went through. Uh, but as you alluded to earlier, there's still some challenges about 2000, according to the state department ed reporter, uh, back last fall, was, or about 2000 that hadn't been approved. And I think the main reason that was cited was the, the, the receiving district claimed they didn't have capacity. And when you got to look at it, it was mostly, most of the denials were coming in districts that are around Oklahoma City or Tulsa Public School District. So okay, the two districts were, which I, I, you know, not trying to be mean here, but the two districts that people generally think of as, as some of the worst in the state are the ones where it is still hardest to get out and get a transfer. And, and there's a number of logistical challenges that are involved with the open transfer law that that sort of play into that. Um, to your knowledge, is uh, is capacity uh, defined by the state or does each district or each school even get to define what each, they consider at capacity? And yeah. can you give us some examples of how that may or may not vary? Each district gets to do it on their own, and and they, I, you know, honestly, I don't know anyone has that anyone has a a database showing what all the policies are. Uh, some of them, I, I saw uh, there was an appeal at the state board of education recently on an open transfer case, and that school I think based it on their junior English enrollment, uh, mm -hmm. and that was it was sort of that was like their their metric to determine if they had enough scoop, break, uh, room in the that school Interesting. for kids, it, it was, it, but it can vary widely. Um, you know, the interesting thing that we've seen is some of the schools has, have said, we don't have a lot of capacity. If you look at their total enrollment, it's down sometimes by several hundred students compared to what it was before COVID, mm -hmm. but they're still saying we don't have room. Um, there is some skepticism on like, is this truly a case of them not having room or is that they just don't want to admit those kids that, you know, it's hard to tell. And, right. and it right. can be that it's, it's by grade also. So one thing we've seen is like a school will say, well, we have 10 spots in the second grade, but we have no spots in the fourth grade. And so you have families, a lot of families have more than one kid. Uh -huh. They can get, they can get Johnny can get the transfer and Susie can't because she's mm -hmm. in the wrong grade. I actually spoke to a mother uh, last year when this, when the law first took effect, who was trying to leave Oklahoma City schools uh, because of academics and, and because of some safety concerns in the school her kids were in. She was able to get one child in, a, in an adjoining district with no problem, but they said, we don't have room for your other one. So she had to go every day. She, she got a transfer to that child to another district on the other side. Uh, so it's like she was driving through three or four districts every day to deliver her two kids to two different districts and oh wow i mean wow. she but that's what parents to, will do right yeah, I mean, I, that's, I, it, it, to to find a school that they feel like is really going to meet their child's needs help that yeah. child develop their skills and, and and interests and talents uh parents are willing to to make those kinds of sacrifices yeah it, I, it, it, it was clearly she felt there was still benefit even with all that um you know but she said you know obviously she she would like it was it was, uh, it was a burden to do that every day. Sure. And she would have loved some other option or an ability to get that kid into both kids into the same school. Uh, sure. So that was I, I would assume that you know determining capacity, you have to take in a lot of factors, not just the number of seats available, number of teachers available to teach, mm -hmm. these kind of things. But it would be nice if districts could could set and publish perhaps a a, a metric that says, here's how we determine capacity for our school. So people know going in, uh, okay, here's what we're looking at and here's how they're factoring that in. And they're not kind of surprised when they, when they get turned down and, uh, and it's not real clear why. Yeah. It, it's, I, like I say, with it being different in every school, I, I think some of the metrics they use, parents won't even necessarily be able to predict looking. Sure until they, they applied and they just, just learned. Uh, they, the schools are required to put a report saying how many spaces available. And so parents do have some idea um, beforehand, but, but it's, it's still, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty.
Now, with this in relation to uh, school choice legislation, legislation that we we saw filed last year, that we're seeing bills filed around this year, uh, either with educational savings accounts or, or other mechanisms. Uh, on the one hand, somebody might argue, well, that would exacerbate the capacity problem because you might have more students wanting to leave than these other schools can accommodate. On the other hand, if they're allowed to go to schools that are other than public schools, mm -hmm. traditional public schools, that might alleviate the capacity issue as they have greater options. Is that is that correct, or am I missing something there? No, I, th I think your description is correct. The the you know, OCPA has supported all forms of choice uh, because ultimately, the more options you have, the more likely it is people are going to find a solution. Sure. Uh, the the Private, if kids could choose private schools as well as other public schools, it probably overall you would have a little bit uh, of a reduction of the capacity problem. Um, now, obviously, you know, private schools, each school is going to have a certain amount of seats, but sure, the the market incentive for the private schools is to to find space when you can, <laughs> and, right, and right, to add on each year, and so I, I think there would be a little bit of of that issue uh, in the initial year of, of a program aligned private school choice, but I think that would resolve over over a few years as schools sort of mm -hmm. adjusted and figured out what the demand was and, and you know how sure. much supply they had. So, but yeah, I think I think it they, they found in Arizona is a state that has a lot of school choice, and what they found is when they had as many forms as possible there was a lot more benefit overall uh, when they had private school choice and charter schools and open transfer, they had students moving all over the place. To, it wasn't all just to private or all just to charter. Like, you mm -hmm. know, some kids would choose one or the other. And there was a lot of, of the public schools uh, there sort of started competing to try and get, because they're like, well, we're going to lose kids to open transfer and to this and that. What can we do to attract replacement kids? And, and sure. so they've seen a lot of, of, of good movement and and focus on, uh, for lack of a better term, focus on the customer, uh, the family, right. and, the, and the children. Um, one of the things that I've heard as as kind of a criticism of these kind of school choice plans mm -hmm. uh, is that it, it goes back to uh, the funding issue, right? The uh, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, schools get funded per, uh, per pupil uh, mm -hmm. and a pupil leaves. And so some of these criticisms have been, well, you're going to reduce funding for these public schools uh, that are in existence. Now, I've heard that it the, the saying, well, uh, the, the state the state per pupil funding will leave, but re remaining funding will still be there. So they're only getting a portion. And so overall per pupil funding will actually go up. Uh, in this scenario. Can you walk me through that? I'm not sure I, I completely understand. I'm sure there's a lot of people who yeah. they don't know how funding works and, and they're probably trying to scratch their heads and figuring out who's who's right, who's who how does this work? So sure. Yeah. The well as you mentioned, it, it, the the funding in the in public schools, you've got your state funding, you also have local property tax funding basically mm -hmm. that supports the school. And then you have uh, federal funding. Um Typically, the federal funding is the smallest portion, although because of, of COVID monies in the last few years, that's really ballooned. Right. But the school choice programs have generally, when you're talking about private school choice, we're talking about taking the a share of the state fund, follows the kid wherever they go. The local property taxes stay with the with the school, the geographically assigned school. Um, the federal monies aren't affected. So you do actually see... in. in Mathematically, if a kid leaves, they you actually have a slight bump overall in per pupil in the school that the child left. Um, we've looked at there's been a number of studies recently looking in other states where they've done this. And, you know, the argument is particularly in rural areas, like well, sure. the the school is going to close if kids have very many kids leave, and, and that hasn't really been the case. They've they've had some rural private schools have opened because of programs. You haven't had a lot of closure. I, I mean, in a lot of cases, families are, are fine with their local school. There's not a, it's not 50% that are leaving typically, you know, there's right, right. there's maybe 
10 to 20 percent of kids that for whatever reason there's something not working out and they'll want to move but uh you know in, in practice we haven't seen schools close because of school choice we've seen new ones open and we've seen lots of movement uh between all the different choices but it, it hasn't really been a kind of a, a the sky hasn't fallen anywhere that they've done this and, and the money it's just the state portion of the money following the kid and i guess one other thing I, probably worth mentioning is when you look at the private school uh, issue the the per pupil the tuition in private schools for the most part is less than the per pupil in public schools and that's even true here in oklahoma oklahoma's i, I you know we're, we're the the story is that we are a lower per pupil funding state than most but even here, uh, when you account for all of the spending in a school, right now it's about 12000 per kid in public schools. The average tuition in Oklahoma private schools has been around six to 7000 And, and you know, there are some that are more than that. Sure. And, and so on. But, but that's kind of the average. So there's actually a chance in some cases you could have kids leave a public school and be able to cover the full expense in a private school and have a little left over that would revert back to the public school system. So it, it the, the, the finances, it, it's complicated to follow, I guess, since for the, for the layman, but it, it really, there's really not a lot of hardship involved for, for any of the schools involved. The, uh, that $12,000 figure that would include the federal monies, state appropriated monies and uh, yes. property taxes, yeah, all that three of those sources. Okay. It's being spent on a, on a kid in a public school. Gotcha. Gotcha. That is correct. I want to go back to the example you gave of the of the mother who was having to go to a couple of different school districts. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things that I know can be a barrier to parents who would like to move their their child to uh, another school, whether it's another public school, whether it's a charter school or a private school, is just transportation issues. Right, mm -hmm. uh, being able to uh, afford to the extra gas, uh, and given that that gas really hasn't uh, de decreased in price a yeah. whole lot over the last year or so, um, uh, gas prices are still high. Logistics, you know, if you've got, as you mentioned, more than one child that you're trying, mm -hmm. those kind of things. My understanding is that, especially with uh, a proposal for these education savings accounts, that those dollars could be used to help offset things like transportation costs uh, of taking a child to a, to a different school. Is that correct? Um, the, I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I think the, the ESA, the education savings account program, is mostly for tuition and uh, educational related expenses, as far as like the cost covering the cost of gas to drive your kid there. I, I don't think that would be an expense you could, could pay for with with your ESA account. Okay. Um, I'd have I, I'm not I, I'm ninety percent sure sure that's the case, but I'd have to I'd have to look back. I guess. Well, we'll, um, we'll uh we can. There's time to investigate that. Is that yeah. right? So uh, yeah. no, but I know that that you know that might be one other consideration people might have in uh, a level of support or or, or not of the, yeah. uh, the 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 these proposals. Um, it seems to me that, and there's there's a couple of different issues when you look at all of these kinds of proposals. And I know, you know, a lot of people uh, use ESAs synonymously with vouchers. I think there is actually technically a difference between the two, both in, in how the money moves, uh, who the money goes to. Uh, mm -hmm. I think with a voucher system, the money goes directly from the state to the institution. With an ESA, it goes to the parent, and then the parent directs it to an institution, uh, a voucher system, I think, would be more restrictive and it would really be limited to tuition yeah. for the most part, where ESAs, you know, a little bit broader. Uh, and I know there's all of these, these, there are pros and cons to all of these types of ideas in that, you know, the, the more, uh, the more items you allow a parent to use those funds for, the more you have questions of accountability, well, what are they going to be spending this on? Are they just using yeah. this money for non-educational expenses? But that kind of assumes that parents don't really care about the education of their children, I think, in some ways. 
but on the other hand, I think there, you know, there are a lot of expenses that are that are related to education that oftentimes we don't factor in. Uh, and if a, if a parent can satisfy their child's educational needs within the framework of the 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 the, the amount given to them through the ESA or, or whatnot, um, they're they're probably saving some money in the long run for everybody, as opposed yeah. to. Uh, being restricted and then just trying to dump it all into one one basket, so to speak. That, at least that just seems to me to be the case. What are your thoughts on that? I, I, I think you're right. I mean, the you know the, the concern there are legitimate concerns about we want to make sure the money is spent appropriately. You don't want, I mean, as we saw during COVID with the the unemployment benefits, that scammers will definitely take advantage if they see it. And so the, the bills have do have some some requirements for auditing a, a certain sure. share each, each year just to make sure that um, things are are are, are proper, spent appropriately. Right. And you can and if you're found to not uh, to be I, I don't know if you're buying a refrigerator for your house instead <laughs> of something for your kid, you're you're going to lose that ESA. Right. Um, right. Um, but th there are I, I think some of the criticisms have been raised. Uh, you know, there was concern uh, over a program where people had bought TVs, but, you know, there's, there's kind of a question during COVID if, because everybody was learning remotely, if they're buying, using smart TVs and, and it was actually being used for educational purposes, that's different than just buying one to watch the football game on Saturday. So sure. you know, there are some questions like that that'll, where, where things that people don't automatically think of as an educational expense may be a legitimate one. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of these costs, ultimately, I think, you know, uh, it, it would it prob we'll probably see savings in, in the long run overall, uh, as long as we have the proper framework in place to, both, sure. to you know, identify the people that really are trying to abuse the system. Right. And I, let's, to be fair to those folks that we're concerned about, uh, if somebody wants to take a hard look at education funding today, we probably can find some wasteful spending that exists yeah. uh, already within the system that is that is there. Right. And so uh, yeah. I think it's I think it's important to remember that no system is perfect in the sense of you're never going to have anybody trying to take advantage of uh, of whatever they think they, they can get out of the existing system. Uh, and so uh, realizing that you want to have those safeguards, like you said, but you also want to build a system that gives people a, a maximum amount of opportunity to find the right educational environment for, for their child. Uh, seems really, to me, that seems really important. Yes. Well, and, and to your point about the, the, the opportunity for abuse that already exists, I mean, it, every year there are the school lunch program, there are people that are, you know, found to have diverted those monies illegally or, uh, if you look at the COVID spending at some of the schools, the the line items that have been provided, there's a lot of them you're scratching your head on. You know, what, how is this COVID related or education related? Um, you know, and, and so there there is there's always going to be that's a human nature, unfortunately. There's always going to be some somebody that might try to game the system, but you don't throw the whole system out just to because a couple of bad apples. I mean, we don't sure. do it with food stamps, we don't do it with Medicaid. Um, and, and so, no, it, it's reasonable to try and put safeguards in place and make sure money is spent appropriately. But the end goal is really like, how's, how can these programs be set up to maximize the benefit to children and to families that, that might have needs that aren't being met where they are? Right, right. Well, Ray, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us today. Uh, I think this is going to be really informative for people who are looking at how would some of these proposals impact my ability uh, to make different decisions if, if, if our family is inclined to do so. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, sometimes just the cost of going to a private school or something like that isn't always the immediate challenge that families face in, in doing this or as we were talking uh, at the beginning, the, the the challenges of moving from one public school to another. Sometimes there are there are challenges there that we don't think of, uh, and in any of these proposals, these that I think it's important that we understand. Well, how will this proposal either help 
families overcome these challenges? Or is there a possibility that they throw up new challenges to them? And so I think that's that's important. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, to uh, walk us through some of these. Thank you for uh, having me on. I appreciate it. All right. We'll talk to you later. Thanks. Uh,